Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being a part of the Lost Planet project. Our dear guests, our representatives of media, our panelists, who are going to be introduced to us later by our talented Samantha Simmons. I'm very happy that I could take my project further than just an ordinary art show. And, um, and to have this discussion here today at the eve of COP26 and today's uh, UK Global Investment Summit. I was very pleased the, with the outcome of our opening on Thursday. The amount of grateful comments I received was just enormous and people were touched to their heart and um, the show made them think about the status and the future of our beautiful planet. Today we are discussing such an important topic or question as is this planet's Earth dying century? And I would like to give the floor to our beautiful Samantha. Uh, Samantha is a journalist and a broadcast and a broadcaster who has been um, on the forefront of the news for Sky and BBC for more than 20 years, interviewing uh, senior politicians and major uh, political, covering major political events. Thank, thank you, you, Samantha, and let's get started. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you very much for asking me to host this breakfast and moderate this panel. Good morning. Welcome to you all. It's lovely to see you all this morning. So as you've seen, this is an incredible uh, installation really here. Uh, it's really my privilege to be part of this. So let me introduce the panel and we will have a chat amongst ourselves and then there'll be an opportunity for you guys to ask questions a little bit later on. So first of all, to my right, Juan Castaño, who is Executive Director of Plastic Oceans Europe, where he supports their major environmental projects in Europe. Uh, Neil Bailey is Director of Philanthropy at Earthwatch Europe, a science-based environmental charity which connects people with nature and monitors the health of our ecosystems. On the far right, Professor Joe Smith is Director of the Royal Geographical Society, directing the Society's work to advance geography and support geographers in the UK and across the world through his work with schools, universities, uh, prior to this, he was Professor of Environment and Society and Head of Geography at the Open University. Barry Gardner in the middle is a Labour MP who served as Shadow Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change and Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade from 2016 to 2020. Welcome to you all. It's great to have you here for this panel this morning. Um, Natalia, though, I'd like to start by asking you about your work um, and how you got interested in using the plastics and using the environment to inform your arts. Thank you, Samantha. You know, I've been always, I love to explore and travel around the world and um, I've seen the most unique and untouched places and at the same time the most polluted and destroyed by human behavior. And I realized that we have forgotten about the key point of our mission on Earth, preserve the planet's heritage for future generations. And this inspired me to create this series of works and to show the beauty of our flora and fauna of our ecosystems and at the same time to draw awareness to the planet's ply. And uh, with the Lost Planet series, I tell the story of from both angles, from beautiful perspective and both and unwanted ones such as wildfires, uh, plastic pollution, rising sea level, mountain glaciers, oil spills, etc. There is a lot happening and um, if we don't take actions now, if, we, if I don't uh, draw awareness to such an important issues, I think it will be too late and I think now it's a perfect time um, at the eve of COP26 and also it was Freeze London. It's the time of all of us to unite uh, because only if corporations, we civil society and governments get together, then we can impact climate change and make a difference. Because only from cooperative level, uh, this issue can be solved and uh, only like this we can make a difference. Okay, thank you very much. So let's start with that question then. Is this dying Earth's last century? I mean, it's a pretty pessimistic um, premise to start from, but I guess hopefully we'll end up more hopeful. Um, Joe, what's your take on this? Is it too late to save the planet? You've been studying this for 30, 40 years now. Well, I, I, uh, I suffer the vice of optimism, and it's probably worth starting by admitting that 
um, and you should read everything I say with that in mind. Um, when I uh, first came across uh, particularly climate change as an issue, there were probably outside the natural science community um, not more than a busload of people in Europe who were engaging with this topic. And um, it did look pretty pessimistic at that point. So I could then give you a list of negative things, but I'm not going to. I'm going to stop with the positives. Neil. You have to follow that. Um, I, I'm with you that it's not, it's not the century where planet Earth dies, but I do think we need to separate our, our ability to exist on that planet versus the planet. The planet's been here for four and a half billion years and will continue to do so long after we've been around. But um, we really need to grapple with, with COP. There are two key dates in this century, 2030, halving our emissions, and 2050, net zero. And at the moment, we're not on course for that. We're looking at 16% increase in emissions by 2030. So there's lots of work to do. COP26, as you say, is also a, a ratcheting mechanism. We need to see the G20 countries come forwards. You know, they account for 75% of emissions and really make those changes. And so I remain hopeful. I remain hopeful too, but I, I think it's interesting that there were sort of two titles here, wasn't there? One was, is this the century in which the planet dies? The other was Lost Planet. Um, and I think we do have to be mindful of what we've lost. And it, it's always difficult whether you look back and say, look what's gone, or whether you actually look back and say, look what we've achieved. And we talk about a lost planet. What we've lost is a huge amount of biodiversity and we haven't even noticed. And the reason we haven't noticed is because each generation baselines. What they do is they look at what they've got and they think that's normal. So, you know, people like me who've been around for, well, let's just say more than 50 years, um, we baseline back in the 1960s. Um, older people will baseline back in the 1950s or 40s or 30s. And this generation is baselining in the 2000s. And we're all wrong. We're all wrong. Because what we've lost in each generation, we just haven't taken account of. I think that's what your work is doing beautifully. Yeah. It's trying to show both. It's trying to show the beauty and also the despoilation. Um, and we need to keep both in tension. That's why, actually, my show is called The Lost Planet, because sometimes we don't appreciate what we have. Yeah. And once we lose it, then we are crying. Yeah. So, and uh, I think that that's why we have to act now and appreciate what we have to preserve. I think it's difficult to be the last one, because we have gone <laughs> through so many different topics. I would like, I mean, I would like to start also saying, like, I'm also positive. I think uh, there have been a lot of, like, positivity, and I don't want to be the negative one in the, in the panel. Plastic pollution now is a, is a topic that has the biggest momentum. Five to 10 years ago, it was not even a topic. We didn't know what plastic was and we didn't care about recycling it. We didn't care about seeing on our parks, on our nature. So it's definitely a lot of like awareness. That's kind of like the positive thing. From me, from my experience, what I see the negative is like, even though there's all this awareness, there are no like actions, but I haven't seen neither politicals, nor like individuals having the courage to, to change the life for the sake of, of the environment. Well, given that the past 18 months that the whole world has experienced when we all were forced to pause our lives and everything ground to a halt, we saw roads empty, the skies empty, and we saw nature return in so many ways. Do you think actually COVID has given us an opportunity to reset the environmental agenda, to take a fresh stock and give it a fresh impetus? Natalia, I'll start with you. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, COVID was a great reset to the planet and we could see how planet can recover. We only have to give time, but there is no much time left because, for example, to, for glass years to recover, it may take hundreds of years. And um, this is the time when we have to think and uh, we have to make an impact. Barry, do you think that politicians also had time to take stock, that it's given them a fresh kind of boost in terms of pushing the environmental agenda? Do you feel that it's risen up there, not just because of COP, but because of what we've all experienced? I, I think there's been a lot of rhetoric to that effect. Um, I think the reality is that people have really understood and begun to reconnect with nature. But I think the political imperative 
uh, now is on recovering the economy. And I think that's a real tension. Um, so on the one hand, you've, you've got a, a sort of public drive that says, yeah, this is important. We understand just how important this is now. But politically, governments around the world are saying, yeah, they're talking the rhetoric of building back better. But actually, what they're doing is they're focusing on, on gearing up the economy again because they're, they're frightened. Um, politicians are some of the most fearful people um, because they're afraid of the electorate and they're afraid of not doing things within the time frame that is an electoral time frame. And I'm afraid that's not what the planet needs. It's not what we need. What we need is people who will look beyond that time frame to a planetary time frame and actually see that regeneration and regrowth coming through. Let me tell you what I think is the most hopeful thing, and, and, and that was the Desgupta the review. And that's really important because it's embedding the environment at the heart of economic policy. And, and that's where the two have got to come together. Yes, I think that, that if we were going to try and really condense into a sentence what Stern did for us in the Desgupta review, it's, are we paying the right price for stuff? So the economists would say this in terms of, are we embedding the social and environmental externalities of what we do? When we talk about the environmental agenda and the pandemic, how do we get to hear the voices of the under underrepresented communities, the poorer elements of society who don't have equal access to, to environment? So they've not only been hit harder by COVID, but also well-being and, and so on and health because they don't have access to nature. So there's a lot of work to be done on, on nature in cities and uh, equality across environmental uh, justice movement. And I work for an organisation called Earthwatch. We're trying to get better at how do we reach out and hear those voices. It's about behaviour change. The pandemic has shown we can change our behaviour very, very quickly. There are issues tied to that in terms of equality, but if, if someone had held up a mirror two years ago about how we were living our lives, people would not, not have believed it. And then the final point is I think the pandemic has shown the importance of science in policy, in informing effective policy. There's a bit of a, a, bit of a blame game going on now with the recent report, but the scientists have really uh, helped policy be more effective. We need to have science in our policy moving forwards if we're going to get to net zero by 2050. And can I just say one more thing, and that is the sort of big picture. Let's remember that this is a zoonotic disease. Um, you know, COVID, came from the incursion and the encroachment that human society is making upon the animal world. And as we invade their space more and more, um, and those interactions become uh, more frequent and less structured, um, the more zoonotic diseases we're going to, to have, the more similar pandemics we're going to have. Getting cities right for climate change, getting households right for climate change um, is, you know, you could call it a challenge. I want to call it the best opportunity we've ever had to give everyone decent housing and a decent experience of walking out your front door and into nature. And that's true in the global south as well as the north in terms of resilience. But that does, I think, imply that in paying the right bill when we buy and use stuff, we view that as a sustainability war chest. And when I say sustainability, I mean social justice as well as uh, environmental uh, protection. But and just the thing to attach at the end of that sentence is it is also an extraordinary opportunity for entrepreneurship. Um, for the development of, uh, of new businesses and the refreshing of old ones. This is the most inspiring change in how economies can work. Uh, climate change is the biggest driver of innovation, with the exception perhaps of the internet, in the last hundred years. Now we've got this huge event in a couple of weeks, COP26, delayed by a year, um, world leaders uh, flying in, you know, not in very environmentally um, a friendly way, but, you know, lots of people trying to it's a, it's a meeting not just of minds, but it is being seen as the most important event for environmental change that there's probably been in the, what, the last 15, 20 years. So we haven't stuck to Paris, um, you know, we've not even anywhere near meeting those targets. Kind of what's the point of this? What's actually going to lead to anything that will really make a difference, which will um, lead to change, that we'll be able to meet all of our targets, that no one in the world is anywhere near meeting at the moment. Um, Natalia, this is so much at the heart of what you're doing and what your focus is. What, what's your yes, thoughts? I think the governments have to review the commis uh, their commitments 
and to see what is realistic and what is not and see how we can act as a community to, to make an impact on climate change. And me as an artist, I want to, to make people feel it in their heart and uh, make changes in their daily life and to contribute to the process of protecting nature and, uh, and prevent the sixth mass extinction on Earth. I think the targets, and I, and I mean the targets like nationally, the targets with the, the Agenda 2030 and all these targets that they are like developing across the countries, it's really, in the, for me, there is like a really thin line of like greenwashing and reality because these targets, most of the time, they are non-binding targets, which means that if you don't reach the targets, it's fine. You come up with new targets, you, re you put the new targets, and then if you don't reach them again, it's fine. You keep doing this and this. So there is actually no commitment to reach those targets. You, you set up like a line of work, uh, but if you don't meet it, if you don't reach it, it's fine. You just put a new line of work. So it's actually, what I don't see is like a real commitment to, to get to that level where we are like meeting targets that are actually working for like the climate crisis that we have. The problem is as well, a major issue is that poorer countries say, well, we can't afford to, you know, make these commitments. We can't afford to reduce our emissions because we're still trying to get to the point where you got to in, you know, the advanced world decades ago. Um, so there is that huge amount of unfairness, isn't there, Barry, that, the, that certain countries feel exists. What do you think is going to be a success for this government? Because Let's talk about what success looks like for the world. Um, success for the world looks like we power past coal um, and there's a coalition to do that. Um, China has helpfully said that it will not fund any further foreign investment in coal-fired power stations, but it still has to commit on its own not powering past coal and it would be helpful to do that. India likewise needs to uh, scale back its, uh, its, its uh, coal-fired power uh, <coughs> targets. They had huge targets five years ago to, to build hundreds of more coal-fired power stations. In fact, those have been scaled back, um, but it's rather through economic reasons rather than through uh, any climate reasons. So we need to see uh, India, China um, and other countries joining the, the, the Powering Past Coal Coalition. Um, that would be the first thing. The second thing is that we need to uh, step up to the plate with loss and damage. Uh, loss or damage has been uh, one of the key political uh, bottlenecks in the negotiations um, because we talk about mitigation and adaptation um, and what we fail to do is to understand properly that for some communities it is not possible to adapt to climate change and classically this is the small island developing states but Bangladesh you look at other countries um, and we need actually to be talking about financial compensation for loss, um, not in a legalistic way, and that's what the, the developed nations have always been very afraid of, that this becomes a legal right. Um, but if we don't talk about this, we're not going to get that, that buy-in. Who's responsible for paying that compensation? Uh, we are. The, the Global North absolutely is responsible for exactly the reason that you said. And it's, it, it's, it's about saying, look, we have benefited from 200 years of development during which we have been causing these problems of rising sea levels that you are now going to be submerged by. Um, and we accept that there is that link and for a long period of time we didn't know it, but actually for quite a substantial period of time we have. Uh, and therefore that's why right back in the Kyoto Protocol it was um, uh, the whole principle that that was based upon um, was common but differentiated responsibilities and we have to carry that through. And the third element is finance that absolutely has to be got right in Glasgow and Paris said that there would be every five years a ratcheting up of the commitments. Now the tragedy is that the commitments we've made already we haven't met uh, and we now need to ratchet them up further and certainly the commitments that we've made are nowhere near rising to the challenge that we all face. 26 is a five year ratcheting up of targets. We're not on target and so we need to see um, improved results and it's going to be difficult but 
progress is not linear. We talk about tipping points in the environment in terms of uh, carbon and um, methane bubbling up from, from um, Russia and so on, but there are also tipping points in terms of behaviour. If we can get a few... I think the UK actually, again, beyond politics, has done very well to date in terms of what it's stated it will do. If we can get other countries following suit, there might be, might be hope. I, I did see the, um, the Australian... Prime Minister prevaricating about whether to come or not. I, I was flabbergasted. I mean, yeah, he's finally deigned to come. Uh, Australia's right in the front line of climate change. And but he's been a sceptic, hasn't he? Yeah, but he's, he's, he, if you look at the um, political, the surveys in Australia, there's a strong will for them to do more on climate change, as in the UK. So at the moment, we need to see other countries follow suit. I think China will eventually follow, but their targets at the moment are to peak their carbon emissions by 2030, not half them and also to uh, be net zero by 2060. So. Joe, what do you want to see from COP? Well, uh, Barry spoke for me, so that's efficient. Um, thank you, Barry. But a, a, a couple of observations. I've been to a few COPs, and uh, they are the oddest meeting you'll ever experience. But actually, the hint is in the name, COP26, COP15 in Paris. Um, this is a process that has a quarter of a century of history behind it, and there are many years ahead of it. So understood as a process, you, 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 you need to stand back and think, what will continue to add pressure and allow this process to continue to move forward in answering the question, which is most important, individual action, business or government? It's a nonsense of a question. All of these things are in a relationship. Whoever we are, wherever we're positioned, whatever we do, then the future COPs will continue to push that forward. But in doing so, remembering that all these things are in relationship, every boardroom is going to be making every decision in a new environment where, for example, they can see that five, eight years out, carbon costs are going to be realistically embedded in every decision. That will transform whole sectors. I think it's important as a reference point to think about going forward in the future, so how we can sort of st stop that, halt it, um, you know, arrest that change. Um, Natalia, you know, you've been doing this for a while, so what are the biggest environmental changes that you've seen over the past decade? Yeah, I think plastic pollution is very close to my heart and it's bothering me a lot. I love the sea and uh, I've been to most unique places and when I find plastic on deserted beaches in Maldives or um, places you can't even expect to see it mm. and uh, you, you want to cry and um, I started collecting plastic and I realized it's not enough. We all have to make changes. Um, each, each of was have to start recycling, for example, refuse from plastic bottles and refill the glass bottles and don't, um, for, when you go to the supermarket, please avoid using plastic bags, take, carry your own fabric bag. Are you seeing the oceans are, is it getting worse in oceans or is it, is it getting better? Is there any well, evidence? I think, I think it's getting better in terms of like awareness and kind of like individuals taking actions and a lot of like political changes as well. So I definitely see a lot of like actions going through the problem. But obviously if you go, it's impossible to go to a beach that is free from plastic. And the reality is like, it's even impossible to go to any place in nature today. Either you go to the beach, to the river, to the ocean diving. If you go to the park, there's always trash. So we are, it's really present, but I'm really positive because it's, there's a lot of efforts to tackle the the plastic pollution crisis. We talk about five drivers of environmental damage. I'll try and remember them. Uh, habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, climate change and over-exploitation. It feels to me that there's lots of things you know, driving those, those, uh, that degradation, but the big one for me is consumerism and just blatant consumerism. It just seems to be escalating decade on decade on decade. The amount of energy we need, the amount of clothes we need just seems to spiral out of control and I think we're not going to fix the problem unless we can reduce, become a less, explo over, uh, less exploitive uh, society. And part of that is um, reconnecting people with their food chain, with the environment. I saw a survey the other day, that was a few years ago now, a third of school children didn't know that 
bacon came from pigs, they thought that cheese came from plants, and over a third had never seen a herd, a cow moo, a real cow moo or a sheep bar, and there's this massive disconnect. I think I both want to look forward and back in trying to answer a really difficult question, and again reference and thank Natalia as representative and champion of the role of the arts in this, with a kind of, okay, it's slightly hammy attempt to find an arts metaphor based in the theatre, which is that I, it feels like the last 10 years has been about developing a more consistent script globally. I think that the conversations that will be had at COP, and let's not forget the biodiversity COP, you know, just as important, um, the, the conversations at these big global meetings are more consistent across the key players than they were 10 years ago. I think that's profoundly important. And, okay, the period we're in right this minute, I do have moments of deep pessimism, and at the same time, it feels like we're in early rehearsals, you know, for the show. And that we are beginning to pick out what, how to deliver some of the lines, where we should stand, and if we can hold all that together, then, you know, I've got in mind, you know, we're only a few metres now from the mousetrap. How many decades is that in? This is the kind of, we're looking for the sustainability mousetrap. How can we get to the end of the century with consistent ideas about how to live decently? Actually, I'll just reference the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Do they look good on a T-shirt? No, they don't. Uh, but this is, um, this is our best plan for trying to get to the end of the century with some decency, with uh, respect and, and a strong relationship with nature. Oh, and by the way, we are in and of nature. Actually, that I think is the thing from this last decade. I think we, we're just dawning on us that we are reminding ourselves that we are in and of nature. You spent a lot of time on, on this project. Um, it's obviously something that you've been focused on for many years. What can art do for the environment, do you think? I think art in general has been used for centuries as a tool to touch someone's heart. And uh, with art, I want to use my voice. I want to use art to bring awareness of such a global issues. And I want the visitors to leave exhibition and to fill it with their heart and, and then really think about the impact of climate change and maybe make changes in their everyday life. Yeah, for it to touch them and then for them to go on and yeah, have and an impact on the, the world as well. yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we have got some time for questions. Yeah. Do you guys feel that there's a, there's a gender imbalance and that it impacts on the conversation if there's not enough female voices being heard uh, and impacting? You look at New Zealand and all these other countries which are being run by women, how they've handled the pandemic and how they've got a better greener track record. Um, Obviously, women's voices need to be heard louder if we're going to get to that point, particularly when we talk about the, the need for connection and so on, not just facts and figures, not just understanding. We know the stats. We've known the stats for the last 50 years. They're all going downwards. How do we actually change things and, and create that connection? In the NGO sector, which is the one that is leading this kind of like environmental voice, at least 80 percentage are women. People from my team, they always laugh with me. They say like, man, you're always surrounded by women. I was like, because- <laughs> Oh, just they, a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but because they are definitely the ones that have that kind of like uh, maternal uh, responsibility. So they, are, they also feel that responsibility towards the planet. So they actually want to care about the planet. And you, you see that across all the, all the NGOs is, and it's just normal stuff. They are like the managers, they are the directors of the NGOs. So they are definitely leading the way in the environmental world. I think there's, a, there's also um, a sort of disconnect between where people live and what they want, and that's really become a focus now, hasn't it? And, uh, but how, mu how much can governments legislate for that? How much thought is going into where we're going to live in 10, 20 years' time? And how can you change where you do live? If you live in a city where it's all concrete and there isn't much green space, who's in charge of that? Because it, it is councils, isn't it? But it, it's a difficult one. I thought, think you spoke brilliantly, rather nicely answering your challenge. Uh, so thank you. I think you set both the agenda for us and much more widely. Um, the, actually, I think we really know a lot about what a sustainable city, village, town looks like. Actually, villages at the more difficult end. Cities can be the most sustainable um, uh, form of living because they, they 
bring us all together, literally. Um, but uh, the, the change, it's back to that thing about it's not about an individual behavior decision, it's not about business, it's not about government, it's about the interrelationships between them. And personally, I just think we need to be so much more demanding of quality. And that means quality for our own uh, uh, experience of design and our place, but really demanding for people who have least control over their choices. Um, and I think Barry made that point really nicely. I just want to tack on one point about women's voices in this. Actually, at the level of international politics, I'm going to draw attention to one woman's voice who was the first international statesperson to, to put climate change on the map, and that's Margaret Thatcher. Now, actually, I don't share her politics, but she, she had a brilliant instinct for how to summarise the importance of climate change. She described it as a massive experiment with the planet itself. And in relation to your point, I think she, she had an absolutely brilliant knack for bringing a global question or a massive economic question down to the level of the household in a way that everyone could understand. And obviously plenty of people voted for that. So let's, let's tune in to some of those tricks about summarising where we could go next in a way that makes it feel like tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday. Neil, how can we impact on the spaces that we live in and our, you know, our cities, our environment? Yeah, I can give a very good example actually. Um, at Earthwatch we've got um, a project called Tiny Forests and we're going to be creating about 100 of these in the next year. They're only tennis court sized woodlands which grow very fast and we deliberately put them into the most deprived parts of the country, into cities where there's no green space, where there's uh, a, a lack of well-being, and we involve communities in the creation of those tiny forests. But it is hard work because you have to find a location, you have to assure the councils that there's no health and safety issues in terms of trees or antisocial behaviour. But it's, it's something we've seen really switch communities on, that need to get involved, to connect to a green space, have somewhere to go. We, we're also a science-based organisation, so we involve them in citizen science. We, we get the communities to monitor the amount of carbon stored, the amount of wildlife, and it really brings home that sort of the power of nature-based solutions and woodlands and natural habitats which need to exist in our cities. We can't just be concrete. And we're not going to solve the climate crisis without solving the biodiversity crisis. We're not going to solve the biodiversity crisis without solving the, sol solving the climate crisis. So these, these issues are all interwoven. Fiona. Thank you, Fiona, and uh, I would love to live till 2091, <laughs> first of all. Yeah, but ideally, I would like my art to be very green, to show the beauty and biodiversity of our beautiful planet, and uh, to see it at least as it is now, but not worse. And I think as well, governments, they need to go and experience and witness and reconnect not only with nature but with this destroyed nature. And doing these summits in Glasgow, they should go to Bangladesh and do the summit and experience politicians on, experience the, the mountains of rubbish that is there that we produce. We are here in this country in a bubble. We don't really know what's happening. We go, we get the stress, we reconnect, we go to Kew Gardens, it is beautiful. You need to go and experience the damage that we are creating in this country, and not only in this country, many of the top countries in the world, the small other, other countries in, around. And then we can understand, and only then we can reconnect and make a consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to work in consciousness. Joe, do you think that's a real issue that, unfortunately, politicians don't actually go and witness the reality of the situation. I mean, you know, everyone will remember David Cameron going out to, I can't remember where it was, with the Huskies. And, you know, they, they, there's those occasional photo opportunities. But do you think that they just don't, they just, there's a disconnect? Uh, German politicians, parts of Yorkshire, if, if, if they're not concentrating on the impacts of extreme weather in those instances, they're, they're just not concentrating. But I want to, to sort of pull on a thread of what you say and take it in, I think, a complementary direction, pointing out is that Bangladesh is becoming a global specialist in climate adaptation 
and that they have lessons that the rest of the world, particularly the global north, need to listen closely to. They do it very cost effectively and uh, they're very proud also that Bangladesh has ambitious mitigation, mitigation targets, meaning cutting emissions. So the, the, the flow of learning is going in all directions, but includes these lessons from uh, what might previously have been considered uh, so victim countries. So if you connect that up with the Bangladesh adaptation um, uh, experience, then it's not about, uh, you know, are we looking at the end of the world? The world's going to get on fine without us. How will we make a good job of living decently on a changing planet? Actually, we know how to do some of this, but we, we do have to concentrate. It feels to me, as I've been a journalist for 20 years, that the conversation has changed and that there is far more being done to try and tackle the bigger issues. I mean, I mean I'm not an environmentalist, I'm not involved with policy, but it just feels that, that I mean, I was, I was saying to Joe just before we started that at the BBC, until a couple of years ago, it wasn't a given that every time we had a conversation about climate change that you had to have someone countering the argument as if that was a, you know, a real genuine um, point of debate and now it's accepted that it's here it's real and the conversation is moving on to what do we do about it so it does feel to me in a, that it, it is more positive but equally being on air this summer it was really depressing I felt like every day I, felt, I said to someone I feel like I'm a news presenter in a disaster movie because every day it was a there was a fire you know there's a devastating fire in Greece or in California there was terrible flooding in Germany with all those people killed you know, it, it really felt this summer that there was a, a massive focus on terrible things happening all to do with the environment and and it's awful but I really I hope that in a positive way it will it's giving impetus to politicians that it is making an impact I mean this is just me as a person and I'm not speaking for anybody else it just you know as someone who's a, a mother of three children who wants to leave a planet behind for them that they can inherit and their kids can inherit you know it's it's something that worries all of us but I feel like the conversation has changed. Hi Natalia how would you measure the success of your exhibition? I was very pleased with the outcome of the show. We had around 400 guests that attended the preview. I got lots of media covering the event. The amount of grateful comments was enormous. And people are coming. The show is here till 27th of September. So please feel free to invite your friends. Uh, you mentioned you are involved with the school, so please bring your students. I mean, does that need to be um, enshrined in law, or is it something, I mean, you see more and more companies, I think, was it Coke that's trying to do, um, phase out their cans that, are, you know, to make them fully recycled? I can't remember, I read one company the other day. It feels like companies are just generally going in that direction because they feel that pressure from consumers. But I suppose you're saying, does it need to be something that governments yeah. say you have to commit to this? It's actually just greenwashing, and I don't yeah. want to be greenwashing. It's like, this yeah. is recyclable, but the lid is it. Like, yes, it yeah. It's like fully mm -hmm. recyclable. Yeah. Whereas it's actually recyclable, and it's actually sustainable, it's actually biodegradable, stuff like that. So, this, I mean, I made the point about embedding the full costs, full environmental and social costs of the, everything we use. But what culturally I think you're trying to do in all that is to reveal what one design thinker calls the hidden ugliness in so many things. And I think your work nicely reveals the hidden ugliness in so much of what we do every day. And connecting the tax system up to our kind of ugliness goggles, our sustainability ugliness goggles, that's where the action is from my point of view. Thanks for bringing it up. Thank you. I'm going to draw it to a close now because we are out of time. Just one last question for you. As we look around at all the incredible objects that you've picked up, how have you sourced all of these pieces of plastic for this exhibition? Yeah, it took me, I think, maybe a couple of years. I've been sourcing it. Um, sometimes I walk in the park, I, p I see interesting pieces of plastic. I pick it up. People look at me like, she must be crazy. <laughs> so, I've been collecting it and I, I become, I think, professional in the plastic and types of plastic. Also, I had my friends helping to collect plastic uh, over three days. I had one family collecting plastic and she, she calls me, Natalia, please come and collect it. I have like 
bags like these sometimes. five huge bags and I don't know what to do with it I, I couldn't realize we consume so much plastic yeah. and I think once people start collecting and then mm -hmm. they become aware how much we consume on a daily basis it's true it's true mm -hmm. thank you very much and um, thank you very much joe neil and wan for your contributions thank you very much for being here just a, a thank you to natalia as well for hosting this breakfast um, and for widening up the conversation it's been really really interesting enjoyable hopefully fruitful hopefully we'll see some good progress in the next few weeks thank you all thank, thank you, you. All for coming. Thank you.